I'm here with famous author Jeffrey Moore. What are we going to do now? Well, continuing our exercise in the writing curriculum, we're going to focus in on the step of invention, which is when a writer figures out what is it I have to say and how am I going to get it said. And so, so what, 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 is, what, what do we see this big block of text for? Well, so one of the things you do in a college a lot is you read other people's writings and then you're expected to develop your own point of view about them. So not just read and memorize and regurgitate, but read, criticize, and then, and then present your own point of view. So I'm going to show you how we actually would do that in a typical writing assignment in any, frankly, any college class. I've picked a text uh, about teaching because it's something that you and I both care about and, and it'd be like a class we might be taking in education. Sure. So I think what we'd like to do here is have you read it out loud and then I'm going to sort of ask you as you're going along to note your reactions and we'll note them down. And that's the first step in the invention process that we call read and react. Okay. Should I start? Yeah, please. All right. So this is, I guess the title is Excerpts from High School Teacher Gerald Conti's Resignation Letter. Where did you find this? Oh, yeah. So this was on the internet a couple of weeks ago. This is where the, we're in April of 2013 here. And basically, it's a wonderful high school teacher who fundamentally had just had enough and in resigning, he sort of laid out what what his feelings were, and they they resonated. It got a lot of it got a lot of uh, uh, circulation on the internet. Okay, so let's read this. My profession is being demeaned by a pervasive atmosphere of distrust, dictating that teachers cannot be permitted to develop and administer their own quizzes and tests, now titled as generic assessments, or grade their own students' examinations. The development of plans, choice of lessons, and the materials to be employed are increasingly expected to be common to all teachers in a given subject. This approach not only strangles creativity, it smothers the development of critical thinking in our students and assumes a one-size-fits-all mentality more appropriate to the assembly line than to the classroom. We have become increasingly evaluation and not knowledge driven. Process has become our most important product to twist a phrase from corporate America which seems doubly appropriate to this case. Okay, let's stop there. So, so as you were reading that, so what are, what are some of the top of mind reactions you had? Um, I empathize with, with where, where he's, he's coming from. I mean, I could, I could imagine being in his position and, and uh, you know, I don't know exactly what he's reacting to. Uh, he's, he's reacting very strongly to something. I, it sounds like someone's telling him what to do, essentially micromanaging him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so we just, if I make some notes somewhere around here, yeah. I'd say something about micromanagement. I'd say something about the strength maybe of the, of the, of the reaction. So, so what, what's going on there? Um, the uh, as you were looking at that, what in your own experience either corroborates that or m might cause you to s question that? Um, you know, I, I I've actually uh, made video content with with some folks that were uh, that were very particular about <laughs> what I what I should cover and what I what I don't cover. And I think for me, a lot of the joy of making videos is my my own kind of personal. Uh, contribution to it, and and I and and I, I personally do react very strongly when when someone kind of tells so, me what what. Yep. So I would circle strangles creativity because that you're, you're clearly you're yeah. clearly empathize, empathizing where, with. Where I think it's that? right yeah, right, yeah, right not there. Not only strangles creativity. Yeah. It smothers the development of critical thinking. thinking in our students. Now, in our students. Now, qu interesting question. Do you think that by strangling your creativity, I'm doing a disservice to your students? Possibly. I, I, it essentially depends what this one-size-fits-all curriculum that's being pushed on to these teachers is, is doing. But I, I could imagine that, I mean, he, he's essentially complaining about two things. One, some, you know, the state or the district or whoever micromanaging what he's doing. Uh, but, but he's also complaining about the actual micromanagement itself, that it's actually probably bad quality. It's something that he would fundamentally... He's not, he's not thinking it's a great curriculum that's being forced on him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, th so there's two interesting points there. One, then, yeah. is the system and the governance. Right, right. And then this other one is the actual execution of that governance by people of low... Potentially, or right. behavior of low quality. What about this idea about um, becoming increasingly evaluation and not knowledge-driven? That one, I, 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 I agree. I think there, too, he's, he's reacting more against bad assessments, much less than, than the, the general idea of assessments. In fact, I, I think if we were to have a conversation with him, my guess is that he wouldn't be 
anti-assessments of any kind. It's just these anti-bad assessments that are that are trying to just capture a very superficial understanding. One size fits all. Teach to the test. I hear, I hear right I hear and teach a to a, a superficial test. But right? but just to develop to, to talk about your point of view a little bit, you actually make quite an important point of including testing in the overall uh, curric- the overall formation of your curriculum. So why do you do that? Why so there is an evaluation part mm-hmm. in there. How is it different from the evaluation he's rebelling against? I'd, I mean, even he also clearly would like to write his own tests and examinations. I mean, he, he complains that he's not being allowed to, you know, oh, good uh, point. Uh, early good point. on. Yeah. So I don't think he's anti-assessment. I, I, I mean, you have to somehow figure out whether the students are kind of internalizing what's, what's going on in the classroom. Um, I, I think... I, I think you know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably agree with him that it's really what the assessment is about. I mean, I have seen a lot of these kind of standardized assessments that get put out, especially at the state level, uh, that really are, are just measuring things at a very superficial level uh, versus versus deep understanding. Okay. I think that's great. And we might capture that, something about yeah. superficial. Now, what we would be doing, um, if Sal was alone, he'd be writing notes on, on the page around it. I'm kind of distracting him a bit with conversation, but he'd be sort of capturing his ideas, where he agrees, maybe where he has a slight departure. Let's try the next paragraph. STEM rules the day. Let me highlight STEM rules the day and data-driven education. We should probably tell people what STEM stands. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, rules the day. And data-driven education seeks only conformity, standardization, testing, and a zombie-like adherence to the shallow and generic common core along with a lockstep of oversimplified so-called essential learnings. Creativity, academic freedom, teacher autonomy, experimentation, and innovation are being stifled in a misguided effort to fix what is not broken in our system of public education, and particularly not at our school. Not at our school. I'm going to double underline okay. that. Okay. So how did you react to this paragraph? Here, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more mixed. Um, I, I mean, I agree with them. STEM, to a large degree, does rule the day. Uh, you know, There's a huge focus on mathematics and science and uh, a lot because that's where at least the perception is a lot of kind of the future jobs are and where there's kind of a and, and where there's we're falling short to a large degree and arguably um, most of your first 1,000 videos were in yes STEM. yes okay. that's where I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm known for okay uh, right. but I don't think that's the the most important thing obviously we're, we're doing other things right now nope, this right, video right, is, right. A, is a sure. non-stem video sure. data-driven education seeks only conformity now I, 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 I know where he's coming from, and I understand his point of view. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think he's saying, I mean, if, if I, I'm trying to understand him, I don't think he's saying data-driven is bad. I think he's, all of this when he's complaining about testing and curriculum and data-driven, he's complaining about the, the variation of that that's being imposed on him. That a, a superficial data is kind of overpowering other things, which I, which I would also agree with, although here, you know, it's, it's kind of data-driven is being just thrown into a one, one big bag. Yes. Um, you know, the, the opposite of data-driven is no data-driven, yes. and, which is also not necessarily a good thing. I would argue there's some name-calling going on in right. this paragraph, which which name-calling is always a bit da- – zombie-like. Was, right. Was oh, my, yeah. This, my, is, this, <laughs> is, this is – yes. This is definitely <laughs> – got my attention. Definitely some, some type of uh, <laughs> adherence to shallow and generic. Yeah, yeah. Shallow and, the ge- and generic yeah, common yeah, core. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is actually interesting. This is another area where, you know – even at Khan Academy, we're looking at the, the, the various standards, including the Common Core. And um, well, I'll, 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 we could go, I could talk for hours about sure. these things. Sure, and, and we could. So, but the point about it is you're developing a point of view where while you empathize with his, um, his emotional reaction and you can see where it came from, your point of view is this is not, this is not a paragraph I think you would have written. No, that's right. How, that's right. How would, what, what, what would you have said about STEM instead? That it, it, it's it's incredibly important uh, that it, it you know regardless of whether you go into a STEM field or not it gives you analytical thinking logical skills uh, there's there actually is a creative po- component to STEM I mean you know this this the E in STEM engineering uh, you know we're in, when you write a paper you're kind of engineering I mean yeah. engineering is fundamentally a creative uh, pursuit yeah it, like writing or or yeah. painting or anything else yeah. and so I I think it's it's STEM shouldn't be just thrown I, I think sometimes. Uh, those in those in you know some those in STEM sometimes uh, belittle 
the humanities as saying, oh, it's just foo-foo, you know, touchy-feely stuff. That's not true. It teaches you critical thinking. It makes you creative, et cetera, et cetera. And those that sometimes in the humanities belittle STEM as like, oh, it's it's robotic. It's one size fits all. It's, it's the right answer versus the wrong answer. There's no creativity. Right. And, and that's completely false. In right. fact, I'd argue that um, to be great at STEM, to be great in either, it's actually you're exercising the same muscles. Uh, great critical thinking, great core skills, uh, but a lot of creativity. That's what differentiates you in STEM or in the humanities. I think that's okay. So that was very cool. By the way, this might be a place for us to kind of pull this thing to a close. We may not need to go after the third paragraph. So what I was doing with Sal was essentially we started with somebody else's uh, uh, letter. And we, the first thing we tried to do was we tried to capture the author's argument. You saw Sal empathizing with him, kind of even going the extra mile to give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, this is what he's saying. But then at some point, he found his point of departure from that. And, and it ended up him saying a pretty interesting thing about the interaction between the humanities and, and the STEM curricula, a little bit of right brain, left brain, and how the two interact with each other going forward. That was his point of view. That was not anywhere in this letter. And the idea behind invention when read and react is you start with someone else's text, you give yourself over to the text, you let the other person's argument hold hold its sway so that you can understand it, but then at some point you diverge from that argument, you depart from it, and you create your own point of view. And in academic writing, that's what they, that's how academics goes forward. You you inherit the tradition with what, what's been written before you, you read it, you react to it, and then you contribute to it going forward. And that's what what the read and react invention process is for.